Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Ian and Scott, and they're going to talk about certificate transparency logs. All right. Cool. That's hey. working. Awesome. All right. All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Ian Haken. This is Scott Behrens. And today we're going to be talking about CATS and certificate transparency logs. Uh, we got a lot of stuff that we want to cover, so I'm going to jump straight into it and start with the question, what is certificate transparency? Because most people I've talked to about this, they kind of have heard of certificate transparency. They know it's a thing that's got something to do with like a public record of certificates. But then you know, if you probe them on it, they're just like, I don't really understand how it works or what it's supposed to do. Um, so let's answer that question. So to understand what certificate transparency is and why uh, we need it, um, let's start by just making sure we all understand kind of the basics of public key cryptography. Um, so let's illustrate how public key crypto works with our classic example of Alice and Bob. So here's Alice. Um, she's a friendly cat. She makes lots of friends. And one day, she runs into Bob. And you know they're kind of different. Alice is more of a home buddy. Bob is more of an outdoorsy type. But they become fast friends anyway and decide that they're going to be pen pals. So the next day, Bob sends Alice a message. And you know this is great and all, but uh, Alice, like, she knows that messages get passed through a bunch of different hands before they get to her. And she wants to know, did this message really come from Bob? And that's the kind of question that public key cryptography was sort of built to help answer. So the way public key crypto helps us with this problem is Bob can generate a public private key pair. And he's able to use his private key to sign messages. And now Alice, as long as she has a copy of that public key, is able to verify that signature. So that's basically all uh, public key crypto is. And that's as technical as we're going to get on how it works. It's really just the idea that you can sign things with a private key. And then with the public key, you can verify that that signature is good. So all right, that's how public key crypto works when you've got two parties involved. But what happens when Alice wants to get on the internet? So well, here's Alice again. She's going to fire up her browser and go to Google.com. She wants to check her email. And the first thing that Google's going to do is be like, hey, please give me your password. I need you to log in to check your email. And you know, this is kind of a problem again, because Alice is like, whoa, like, who's asking for my password? I think it's Google, but the internet's a scary place. Like, I've seen some of that stuff out there. Um, how do I know this is really Google? And we solve this problem the same way, right? Google has its own public-private key pair, and it signs the uh, you know, messages that it's sending back to Alice with that private key. Um, but the problem is, Alice doesn't have Google's public key. And it's impractical for Alice or her browser to have all the public keys for all the websites on the internet, because there's hundreds of millions of those. And they're constantly changing. So there's no way for Alice to have all of those public keys in advance. So the way we solve this problem is with third parties known as certificate authorities. So here's our example certificate authority. So this is Digicat. And he takes the internet very seriously. He's filled out a bunch of paperwork. He has these policies posted that all say, like, I take the internet super serious. Um, you can trust me to, like, be a good citizen in this internet ecosystem. So Digicat has a public private key, just like all of our other players in this game. And because we trust him to take this internet seriously, we embed his public key in the browser. And so because Digicat is one of these trusted certificate authorities, Google knows that when they want to start a website, they should go talk to Digicat and be like, hey, Digicat, can you please help me create a trusted website on the internet? And what Digicat does is it creates one of these certificates. So it says, Google.com has this public key. And that's all a certificate is for, for our intents and purposes. So Digicat signs this certificate with their private key, hands it over to Google. And so now Google has a copy of this certificate. And they can include it whenever they send Alice or anyone else a message. So Alice has the public key of Digicat. They can, so Alice can verify that this Google.com certificate was really signed by Digicat. Then, they, then Alice can pull out that public key for Google, verify that that message was really signed by Google. And so now Alice has confidence, hey, this really came from Google. This message is trustworthy. I'm going to send Google my password. So that's awesome. That's how the internet works. That's what makes us all safe on the internet when we're sending our passwords around. The problem is not everything is awesome, right? There's stuff about this whole infrastructure that makes us sad. Um, and the reason that some of this stuff can make us sad is that you don't just have this one like super awesome certificate authority in your browser. You have a whole herd of them, right? There's all of these different certificate authorities that your browser trusts. And some of them are a bit better about being serious you know, internet business cast than others. So here's an example of a cat that's maybe a little overwhelmed with his responsibility. So this cat is Simon, and he runs a company called Simon Tech. And he's maybe not so great at being a CA. So like sometimes it doesn't work quite right. 
Um, but he is a CA, just like anyone else. He's got his own public private key set, his public key is embedded in the browser. But because his CA isn't always working properly, every so often what he does is generate some random keys and create a Google.com certificate with those keys. And then he's able to look at that certificate, verify that like Firefox works properly with that certificate. And he's like, all right, my CA works, I'm just going to throw this away. Um, but there's a problem there because, you know, we don't know if there's an employee that's going to come around, some malicious employee like Mallory, who instead of throwing those keys away after this test is done, just runs off with them. And now, if Alice tries to go to Google.com and Mallory is in a position to be in the middle of that traffic, be a man in the middle, like maybe Mallory's just sitting next to Alice in the coffee shop, then uh, Mallory can intercept that traffic, sign back a please give me your password message with this random public private key. And because that, the public key is in that certificate that was signed by Simon Tech, um, now Mallory is able to get Alice's passwords and all her emails and everything in Google Drive and all that. And the biggest thing that's a problem about all this is that Google was not involved in this transaction at all. Like, they had no idea Simon Tech made the certificate. They have no way of knowing Alice got duped by a malicious certificate. So this is the problem with the CA infrastructure that exists today. So now we come to certificate transparency. What is certificate transparency? Well, it's a project started up by some really smart folks at Google to kind of solve this problem. It's trying to remedy certificate-based threats by making the issuance of certificates more open to scrutiny and more uh, auditable. So it's got three main goals. The first is to make it impossible for a CA to create one of these certificates, like one of these Google.com certificates, without Google knowing. And it's going to do that by making the whole issuance of certificates a public activity, something that's a matter of public record that everyone can look at and audit. And ultimately, by having these pieces in place, it's going to ultimately protect the users who want to go to Google and know that when there's that little green lock icon in their browser, it's actually something meaningful and not a malicious actor. So it's a project to make us safe. Awesome. What is a CT log? So a CT log is something that is the sort of key component of making the certificate transparency project work. So it's basically just a simple network service. So it's a RESTy service. It's got an RFC. It's got like a dozen different endpoints. It's not that complicated. And all it really does is log certificates in it. So it's a record of all the certificates that are getting issued. But it's got some really important qualities that actually make it useful. So the first is that they're append only. So it's got some crypto built into it, and its APIs only have APIs for adding new certificates. And because of these properties, you can't retroactively remove or modify or delete entries out of the log. And they're cryptographically assured in this property. So whenever a new entry is added, you take a hash of the previous entry along with the new one, and then you sign that hash. And basically, if anything were to be modified anywhere back in the log, this chain of hashes wouldn't match up, and, the, uh, and everyone watching these logs would be able to realize that this is not a trustworthy log anymore. They've done something. They've removed or modified some entry. And also, very importantly, these are all public services. So they're out there on the internet, and there's no restrictions about who can retrieve or even insert data into them. So there are many CT logs. Like I said, it's an open RFC. So Google runs a bunch. Digicert runs a bunch. Cloudflare runs a bunch. There's Komodo certificate logs. Um, so great. That's what a certificate log is. How does having that log actually protect us from malicious certificates? So Chrome, in the last year or two, started requiring something called SETs be presented with certificates. So an SET is a signed certificate timestamp. And all that is is it's a promise signed using the private key of one of these CT logs that says, I promise to put this certificate in my log. And that's all it is. And as long as your certificate is pre presented with one of these promises, Chrome is able to trust it now. And now the other piece of that, though, is that Chrome in the background is going to check that these SETs have actually been honored by this certificate transparency logs. And it does that by just in the background, as you're out there browsing for pictures of cats on the internet, taking all these certificates that it sees with these SETs, and then going and asking the log, hey, prove to me that you've actually added this certificate to the log. So if a log doesn't put one of these certificates in there, we know that it's signed this SET. We can verify that signature. We see that it's not in there. And now we know that log is misbehaving. So Chrome is sitting there making sure these CT logs are actually doing what they're supposed to. And all the hundreds of millions of installations of Chrome are verifying that these CT logs are actually behaving properly. 
So all right, that's like five or six slides all about how CT works. But what's the really short version of this, especially for the purposes of this talk? So certificates have to have an SCT presented with them in order for them to actually be trusted and be usable. So an SCT is a signature from one of these logs promising that the certificate will show up in the log. And Chrome is going to notice if it doesn't actually get added to the log. So logs do actually have to behave when they're creating these SCTs. And because of crypto, a log can never remove or alter entries once it's been added. Again, if an entry were to get removed or modified or deleted or redacted, then none of these hashes would work out. All these installations of Chrome would realize this CT log is misbehaving. And then that log would no longer be trusted. We no longer take SETs from that log, et cetera. So all right, so, so CT logs have to behave in order for them to be trusted by Chrome. That's how CT works. That's how it's making us safer. But we're not really here to spend all day talking about how CT is awesome. We're here to talk today about how CT can be abused. So, that's, so after kind of learning about this whole ecosystem, I sat down and was like, all right, this is a new toy. What can I do with it? So the first thing and the thing that we've heard people talk about a lot is that CT logs provide a way for attackers or pen testers to do infrastructure reconnaissance. So any time a certificate is created for some kind of web service, whether that's an internal service or an external one, it has to show up in these public logs. So you can enumerate internal or external domains that are potentially interesting. So you can search for admin.microsoft.com and see what shows up. And in particular, you can probe all of these domains from an external vantage point and see which ones don't respond. So that if you ever get a foothold into a corporate network, if an attacker gets that foothold, then they know which ones are probably internal ones and may have nothing more than that network perimeter protecting them. So I ran a search for admin.microsoft.com and lots of things popped out. Here's a bunch of billing admin consoles that showed up in the CT logs. I didn't actually go probing these things. I don't know if they're internal or external or not. I don't even know if they still exist. Some of these had expired. But they're there, and they're a matter of public record. So something else that's important about the CT logs is that they do include the entire certificate. And that includes the public key that corresponds to that certificate. And so if there's any sort of problem with that key, if there's any weaknesses with that key, attackers can go looking through the logs and find those keys that they can ultimately break. So there was a talk presented at DEF CON last year that was about breaking keys at scale and using big data to break RSA keys. And what they did, among many other things, is basically scraped a whole bunch of certificates by scanning the internet and scanning CT logs and running some GCD algorithms to factor RSA keys. And ultimately, they were able to get out to break the keys of over 200 certificates that they pulled out of the CT logs. And this is a little terrifying, right? If there's anything wrong with how you're generating the keys for your certificates, whether it's because you're running in the cloud, so you had a weak entropy pool, or you're running on an embedded device, and it's just started up and didn't have a great entropy pool, um, there are attackers out there looking for these keys, and they're going to find out if your domain is vulnerable to just factoring the key and then masquerading as your website. So that's a little terrifying, right? You should be paranoid that like your crypto has to be perfect now. Otherwise, attackers are going to be on the lookout for it. But what I thought was one of the most interesting consequences of the CT logs is that it's a persistent data storage of all the certificates that are ever created. So CAs have to publish CT logs in order to, they have to publish the certs into the CT logs in order to get those SETs. A CT log can never, uh, well, it has to add the cert to the log, and it can never remove those entries, and the CT logs have to be available and be presenting those certificates back to anyone who queries. Otherwise, that log is considered to misbehave. And so I was kind of thinking through like what all this meant, and I had like a whoa moment. I'm like, OK, so anyone can create a certificate with one of these CAs, and then that certificate has to go into logs, and then that certificate can never get removed from logs. Like, all right, so that means I can put something in the CT logs, and then it never goes away. So what, what does that mean exactly? So here's an example certificate. So I'm actually going to pull this up, look at the CT logs right now. It's issued by Let's Encrypt. It's got a public key, yada, yada, yada. And then you get to the domain <laughs> names. And it's like, that's interesting. There's clearly some structure to these domain names. Uh, what exactly is going on here? So let me play a quick video um, that sort of goes through pulling down the certificate and kind of munging those domain names a little bit so that we can see what's actually 
uh, basically been encoded into that certificate. So first, we're just pulling that thing down and getting all the host names out of it. So here's exactly the same set of host names you just saw before. So we're going to clean it up a little bit, replace that DNS colon with new line, so we get each host name on its own line. Um, then we're going to, uh, so we've got these leading, uh, well, so first of all, we've got that common suffix on the end of all these domains. That's clearly not useful information. We'll throw that away. Um, and then we've got these leading numbers at the top, which are basically there to order these host names. Because when a CA makes a search, it's not necessarily going to honor your ordering. So we use that number to figure out how to sort these. Uh, we sort them according to that numbering. Now we're going to remove any trailing noise, get rid of those numbers. Um, last thing, we'll remove any dots or commas that are left in here. And so what we end up with is just you know, that cleaned up data set of those host names with the prefix and the suffix stripped off. So last step, we're going to take that data. We're going to translate it from lowercase to uppercase, because base32 decoder is picky. Um, and I'll talk about why we're doing base32 encoding later. But what we get out is a JPEG. Cool. So that's an example of what I mean by you can put data into CT logs, and then it is there, right? So all right. Exactly how interesting is this? How much data can you really put into CT logs, right? Because that was a bunch of crazy encoding magic, and certificates are only so big. So how much data can you put in a certificate? So Let's Encrypt, which is the free CA we all know and love, lets you put up to 100 host names in a certificate. A host name can be up to 230 characters, according to Let's Encrypt's limits, minus the dots. Um, and any character that's alphanumeric can be put into a host name, but it's not case sensitive. So if you're trying to encode data using just alphanumerics in a case insensitive way, that's why you'd end up using base32. Um, so given that the shortest domain name that you can buy nowadays is going to be a six character suffix, you can basically encode 230 characters minus four dots minus that six character suffix times 99 sans in a cert. I subtract one because one goes in the common name, and let's just ignore that. Um, base 32 encoding, you get a 5 over 8 compression ratio. Basically, you can get about 13K into a certificate. So all right, that's kind of OK. It's enough to get a like low quality JPEG into a certificate like I just showed you, but maybe it's not actually that interesting of a thing to do. So, but you know, we're computer scientists, right? We, we know how to kind of address problems of limited sizes per unit. Uh, you use chunking, right? So you can chunk your data up into multiple pieces and then throw all those different pieces into your storage mechanism. And what's important is that when we mint a certificate through a CA, they have to include those SETs with the certificate that comes back. And the entire point of an SET is that it tells you how to look up that certificate in the certificate transparency log later. So the next time we mint a certificate that has our next chunk of data in it, we can include that information on how to go find the previous certificate from the CT logs. So first piece of data you put up there is just the uh, first data chunk. But then the next one includes a reference back to the previous certificate about how to find that certificate in the CT logs, and so forth. So you can end up shoving arbitrarily large data up into the CT logs that's chained this way. And all right, that's a bit more complicated than the sort of like vim, cat, grep, uh, foo that we showed you on, the, on that video. You really kind of need a tool to do that, um, to intelligently pull down the chain of certificates. So I created a tool for that. Uh, it's called catlog, and it's for putting cat into CT logs. Um, all right, so what does catalog do? So it's an open source tool. It's written in Python. You can go check it out and play with it. But it abstracts the CT logs as a data storage provider. So it's got a push command. It's kind of modeled on Git that lets you push something up there, and then it's in there forever. And then you can pull down files later. And it builds an additional layer of abstraction on top of that. So it lets you put all of your files into a box or all of your cat pictures into a box, as the case may be. So you can run a command like catalog init and then give it a domain name. You can push a few files. Then you can run catalog commit, which takes that index, that uh, collection of files and those references, and puts that into CT logs. And then later, you or someone else can run the catalog clone command to get all those files back down out of it. So let's do a demo real quick. So I've pushed a bunch of files up into CT logs um, over the last year. And so I'm going to start with an empty directory. I'm going to run this cat long clone command. And this is live demo, so hopefully the internet's good and this actually works. And we're waiting. Go and we're waiting. Go internet. Hey, all right. It didn't give me an error. So cat log status. Um, here's uh, the, f oh, hey, I cloned the wrong thing. Let me try again. <laughs> 
demo2, catlog clone demo.catlog.pw. All right, trying one more time. Cool. <laughs> That's a different demo that I'm going to show you in a minute. <laughs> and it's still taking a while. All right, so catlog status. There we go. This is, these are all the files that I've been uploading. There's a lot of them. So let's, uh, let's pick one at random and do catlog pool on it. So what you can see here is now it's actually hitting all the CT logs to pull down all the certificates it needs in order to reconstruct this data. And, this, uh, it, and none of this is actually hitting any domains I own or host. This is all just going directly to the CT logs. In fact, when these domains expire and I have no intent of renewing them, this data will still be in CT logs. I don't have to own these domains anymore for this to be available. So there's my cat file, and I can open it up, and it's a picture of a cat. Hooray! Uh, so let me do one more. Uh, let's start pulling this down. So this is a video file, and this file is about five megs. It's spread over around 350 certificates. So this is actually going to take a while. So I'm actually going to flip back to the slides, and if we've got some time at the end, we'll come back to it. Um, but that's th those are a bunch of ideas about how you can abuse certificate transparency logs. And now I'm going to turn it over to Scott hey. to talk about are there other people doing this? <laughs> hey everybody. Okay, so. When Ian was originally discussing this idea with me, I, I, the first thought I had was like, we can't be the only people who've thought of this, right? Like, because we've seen folks sort of abuse sort of blockchain style technologies to embed data permanently in the internet before. So it seemed really similar to that. I figured we weren't probably the first folks. So when I was approaching the research component of this to see if we had any evidence of folks doing this, my hypothesis going in was to look for large certificates with many SANs, right? So like, let's look for ones that have a lot of data that are kind of outliers. If we were to run a distribution, would kind of show up on the high end of the Z index. Um, and I wanted to do two things with those large certificates. Calculate entropy to look for evidence of encryption. I thought this would be potentially an interesting mechanism for C2. Maybe you have your command set stored in these persistent logs, but you might encrypt that because you don't want folks to know what you're doing. And then I was also looking for magic numbers. So for those who aren't familiar with magic numbers, these are like a constant number that you'll find in the file format that, that's used to identify that file. So here's a couple examples for GIFs, JPEGs, and ELF binary formats. So I wanted to make sure we were checking for those things within the SAN certificates in the event that they were storing some sort of media. And help me, in order to help me use, uh, to do this research, I used an open source tool called Axmen that uses the async IO library in Python to pull down all the certificates from a certificate transparency log. And it worked pretty well for my use case, but I had to make a couple of modifications to really make it shine for what we wanted to do on an analysis perspective. Yay. Cat. Um, so we made a couple of modifications to Axman. Um, I wrote all the uh, certificates I was pulling out of the Icarus log uh, into Hive, where we did our analysis with some support from Reiko, one of my colleagues who's sitting up front here. We also calculated the entropy in advance. We plucked out the public key in case we wanted to do something with that later. Um, we stored the cert size and the bytes for filtering. And then we looked for the magic numbers in the SANS. So let's take a look here. Okay, so here I'm running a count against uh, the table we've loaded up that has the certificates in it, just to kind of show how many certificates I was working with. It was roughly 455 million certificates uh, that we used for our analysis. The next thing I did is I ran a query to look for file types that match that magic number. I used a Python library to help with the, with the matching, and we ran that query across the data set, and sure enough, we showed up. So at least we knew that our research worked. We found our BBB derp fish, which is our cat certificate. That's what we demoed earlier in that first video, which was awesome. Um, so it was pretty excited, like our stuff showed up. And then our second test cert, cert showed up, except there was this third cert, cat.jpg that we have the tech. Like, this isn't us. We didn't do this. And wait, there's like numbers in the certificates. And there's a ton of SANS. It looks like it has an ordering system. Like, there's, like, there's no way that the only other person that did this put a cat in the logs, right? Like, that would be, that would be way too strange, right? Okay, so we've kind of figured it was maybe like a red herring or whatever, but when I pulled the certificate up and looked at it with my, hand, my eyes, I was like, this looks a lot like what Ian put in the logs. And so, okay, so the curiosity got the best of us, and we went back in and uh, decided to take a deeper look. Okay, so... Interestingly enough, 
this part of the video looks really similar to the first one. So I kind of just fast forward a little bit to save you. But you know, I was kind of we were kind of slicing and dicing all the same kung fuery here, and uh, we ultimately get a little bit further down the line, deleting the numbers, sort of cleaning everything up, and then um, we change the case, we pipe it into a file. Uh, we, I ran a file on it because I didn't believe it. it. It says it's a JPEG. Is it a cat? It's a cat. <laughs> it's a cat. <laughs> okay, give me just a second here to get to presenting. Okay. Escape. Present. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so I was really curious to who this was. Um, thanks to Privacy Guard, I can't find any information out about who owns the certificate. It was issued in Australia. Don't know a ton of Australian security researchers. Um, we asked some folks. We, we were un unfortunately we don't know who owns this. If you own it, please raise your hand or come talk to me. That would be fascinatingly strange. But of all the analysis we did, this was the only other person that was putting cats in uh, cats in CT logs. And this person has done some really interesting stuff. Like they have a number of certificates that have some numbers and text. Uh, we think they might have some binary data in one of the certificates. So for you, for all you out there who are really good at analysis, like please take a look at their certificates and let us know what you find. Because um, I was super, super interested in trying to figure out who this was. So I want to do a quick summary of my analysis. We're running a little short on time, so I'm going to try to breeze through this. But First uh, assumption that we work with Rika with was we wanted to look for certificates that had more than 100 SAN certs, and then we were looking for things that had really long SAN length. And interestingly enough, when we found certificates that had 100 SANs in them, there wasn't a lot that even had a max length. I think we talked 230 characters. It wasn't even really that showed up. So this ended up being not a great search. So we refined this a little bit and said, all right, let's look for certs that have at least 75-ish SANs, and at least one of the SANs has a length greater than 200. And this ended up being a really good search. This, we found some really interesting certificates this way. Uh, the ones that I've colored out here were the ones that ended up being interested. Some of these other certificates ended up not being that, that interesting. So this was the first certificate I found. I want to let folks take a second to read the certificate. So this is pretty awesome. So this person loves Star Wars. So that was a good certificate. Um, we found a, a couple of certs with good entropy. This POC that we have, the tech, this had the highest entropy for the, for the greatest number of SANs. It looks kind of like binary data. We're not sure how to sort it. I'll zoom in a little bit. It almost looks like it has a pattern. I don't know. I'm not, we, we couldn't quite crack this one, but it's, it's one worth checking out if you are interested in this space. Um, this was a pretty cool one. There was a ton of SANs in this certificate. Pretty convincing for low resolution displays. I mean, it looks like account google.com. If it's a valid certificate, it's going to show up as such. So we saw a ton of these in the CT logs, a lot of this being a common phishing pattern. Have account google.com and a giant max length string afterwards to trick your victims to do phishing. This was a cool one multi domain proper. I was actually just mostly interested in the name of that. And so I Googled it, obviously, like a good laser cat would. And it came back with this thing that looked like a blog written by someone named Martin Wallace. I don't know this person, but I figured probably have a, probably have a LinkedIn. So I sent Mar Martin a, a note and said, hey, I'm working on the AppSec team at Netflix. I've been doing some research and cert logs. What is this thing you're doing? He goes, you got us. Our prober might be somewhat chatty, and then he links me to some public docs about their managed SSL um, product that they built for GCP, which looked, or a Google App Engine. So that was kind of cool. Don't know exactly what the prober does. He wouldn't tell me, but I did catch him. Cool. So I'm going to toss it back to Ian to do our wrap up here. All right. Yeah, just going to uh, wrap up the last, last few slides here. Um, before we do it, uh, let's check our video. It, it looks like it finished downloading. So there's our yellingcat.webm. It's uh, about four and a half megs. Um, it's a WebM file. And if we play it. <laughs> it's about two minutes of this cat yelling at this, this person who won't let him in. So yeah, you can get some pretty high quality video shoved up into CT logs. Um, <laughs> so all right, final thoughts. Uh, certificate transparency, it is awesome. I know we've spent like the last half hour kind of being like, here's some weird stuff we can do with it. But like, don't get me wrong. CT is awesome. And it is an amazing thing that we have this because it's making us safer. Um, but there are bad things 
about it, right? It puts all of your internal domain names on display. It gives attackers a roadmap of what to do when they get in your network. It puts your weak crypto on display. If you're doing things badly, like crypt, uh, attackers are going to be looking for it and are going to abuse it. And lastly, it's a non-redactable, unmodifiable, append-only public data store that anyone can write to. And if you were to change any of those adjectives in that sentence, it would significantly weaken the whole point of having the CT uh, project and the CT system. And you know, we're we're being you know non-malicious about this. We we threw a bunch of cat pictures and cat videos in there. But if someone's putting pirated content up there, if someone's putting doxing someone's personal information, if there's any kind of like bad material in there, the people that run these CT logs don't have the liberty to take it down. They cannot redact information. And if they were to pull down their logs, like the CT project would just die. So it's potentially a problem. So all that said, I want to give a special shout out to Reka, who's over here. She helped us do a bunch of this big data analysis and show us how to shove things into Hive and do good queries on it. I want to thank everyone that's posted pictures of cats on the internet to made making the slides super easy. Um, I want to thank Google and all the CT log owners and Let's Encrypt. Uh, their services were used and possibly abused a great deal in the ongoing uh, production of this research. And I also want to say sorry to all those people. Um, hopefully you appreciate that we're security researchers trying to do awesome stuff. Um, and one last thing before I let everyone go to lunch. Um, if you thought this was interesting, if you liked the talk, I encourage you to download the slides and check out the links. Um, if you're looking for the slides, they're in the CT logs. Um, so with that, we will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ian and Scott. Uh, it's lunchtime, so if people who want to leave uh, can leave. There are a couple of questions that came on Slido. Uh, the first one is, uh, are you aware of any developments uh, that will legally survive given the existence of newer right to forgotten uh, legislation that's coming up? Yeah, so uh, one thing that we didn't really get into is, I, is that something that CT log providers have done is they've started kind of temporally sharding their logs. So there's one log that all the certs expiring in 2019 go into. There's one that all the ones expiring in 2020 go into. So once 2019 is over, none of those certificates that have expired in 2019 really need to be kept around and need to be in logs. So there is a way where sort of logs can eventually kind of roll off and no longer need to be publicly hosted. So that's at least a way to kind of mitigate the fact that like you can't take these things down on demand, but they'll at least kind of roll off as certificates expire. Um, in terms of any other answers for like how to mitigate these issues, we're not really we're not sure. sure. <laughs> yeah. Was there one other one? Cool. All right, that was it. <laughs> okay. Thank because you. All right, we'll be around if you want to chat with us. Thank you. Thank you. All right.